I and uh, on the previous uh, uh, on the previous lesson, uh, as far as I understand, we discussed uh, you discussed with Ivan uh, uh, the beginnings of uh, regression analysis, uh, specifically bivariate regression. Am I right? So, is it true that you discussed regressions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it was bivariate regression uh, when you have one uh, independent variable and one dependent variable, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's great. And uh, today we will discuss uh, a more complex case uh, of regressions with multiple variables. Uh, in fact, uh, it is a rather important case because in various uh, in various stations uh, you are interested uh, not in uh, just bivariance uh, dependence, so you're interested not in the dependence between two factors, uh, how are they are correlated, but you're interested about something more uh, more complex. You're interested in, uh, you're interested in how several factors can affect uh, one. Something like this. Yeah, you know that uh, there are various cases uh, when you have these multivariate dependencies. Like if you think about language, uh, you know, for example, it is possible that several factors of different of different nature can lead to uh, like to choice uh, of which word to use, which form of the word to use, and so on. And uh, in something um, more related to social linguistics, uh, you can probably assume that if you have a person with some um, social demographic characteristics and you're interested in the relation between some linguistic features of the speech of this person with uh, their you know, social linguistic characteristics, again, it is possible that you have this, uh, this uh, case when several factors affect some some variables that, uh, some variable that you are interested in and uh, so we will begin uh, discussing regressions with multiple variables and actually uh, i'd like to introduce them as a natural tool to uh, to discuss um uh, to discuss some questions that are related to um, uh, causal analysis. Uh, in fact, th this is this is rather um, uh, rather tricky topic in statistics because you know that if you have uh, if you have correlation between two variables, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, you necessarily have uh, some uh, some causal relation between these variables. Um, for example, mm, I don't know, we can, uh, we can consider something like, mm, uh, for example, uh, again, we are studying, uh, we are studying uh, children and uh, we have the following variables. We have uh, weight of a particular kid, and uh, we have a number of words uh, that uh, this particular kid uh, uh, has in their uh, linguistic repertoire, uh, language repertoire. And uh, it is possible that you have dependence uh, like this. Uh, and uh, it is possible that you have correlation between weight uh, of a kid and number of words. Uh, something, something like something like this. So we have some 
uh, relation that is that can be approximated by some linear law, uh, as we do in regression analysis. But uh, does it mean that uh, that weight uh, influence number of words causally? Is it is it true that the reason why uh, certain uh, certain kid uh, knows more word is that uh, they wait more, uh, or in other words, uh, is it true that if uh, I, I want to know more words, I have to eat more food, and uh, in this way, according to this picture, I will get, uh, I will learn more words automatically. Uh, how do you think? Are kids of the same age? Uh, let us assume that they are of different ages. Otherwise, uh, they are, otherwise this picture does not uh, have so, so so trivial interpretation. Uh, so let us assume that uh, there are kids of different ages. So, what? Uh, what interpretation you can uh, provide for this data, for this correlation between number of words and weight? Uh, does this picture look plausible? It is, is, is it possible that we really get to this kind of data if we study kids, for example, from age three to age 10? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, why? <laughs> because kids, uh, when kids is older, it is it has bigger waist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so age is dependent on weight. Weight. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, if we if we are speaking about causal relationship, to, uh, uh, then we have to take into account that uh, we have age as uh, the uh, as the cause of both increase of weight and increase of number of words. So the causal diagram uh, looks like this one, and. Uh, of course, it doesn't mean that we have any uh, arrows uh, between this uh, between this variable and this variable. Here on this causal diagram, this arrow is causal causal relationship. So age affects weight, and age affects number of words, but not vice versa. It is not true that if I want to get older, I have to learn more words. Uh, this there is no uh, causal relation in this direction, um, and uh, we see that this correlation between these two variables can be explained uh, by this causal diagram, and uh, we see that there is no any causal relationship between uh, weight and number of uh, words. Uh, so. And this is uh, this is actually uh, what we um, uh, what we have very very often when when we are trying to analyze data, and we are trying to uh, make any kind of uh, causal conclusions like this is uh, the reason of that. Uh, then uh, we have to be very cautious uh, because. It is possible that uh, if we are trying to interpret, um, we, we are trying to interpret correlations like this uh, in terms of a causal relationship, uh, we can uh, make completely incorrect, uh, incorrect interpretation, correct conclusions. Uh, so um, there is a mantra that all uh, teachers of statistics uh, tell their students that cause, uh, that correlation does not uh, imply co uh, um, that correlation does not imply 
and does not imply causation. Um, this is a really popular mantra, and uh, in a sense, uh, it is it, it, it looks very pessimistic because in data uh, we can see only correlations or something like them. But uh, what we are interested uh, in uh, is usually this causation. We are interested in laws that govern some natural phenomena. We want to answer um, some causal questions. And uh, this, uh, this mantra says basically that in some of cases, we just can't, can't say anything. But anyway, uh, we can try. And now let us discuss uh, the following example that is not, uh, not very linguistical, but uh, rather, uh, uh, I think, uh, rather understandable. Uh, let us assume that uh, we are discussing, is it true that smoking is bad for your health? In fact, now it is a consensus that smoking decreases uh, decreases your life expectancy that smoking is bad for your health but um, uh, I think 100 uh, and and so years ago it was an open debate uh, and uh, actually at that time statistics uh, was born and um, people who created statistics uh, uh, some of them especially, if I'm not mistaken, Fisher um, was uh, a very, uh, a very well-known smoker, and uh, they argued that there are no scientific evidence in favor of uh, uh, in favor of the fact that smoking kills. Uh, despite the fact that at that time already some statistics, already some data, already was gathered on the smoking. And let us assume that we have a data that looks like this. Uh, here we have here we have life expectancy. So uh, years. And here we have number of cigarettes. Some kind of smoking level. And let us assume that we have a data like this. Something like this. And OK, probably I have to uh, shift it somewhere here, because otherwise uh, we will assume that people, that there are no people who don't smoke. Uh, let us add some points here, non-smokers. And uh, we can fit a linear regression. We can fit a regression line. And uh, this line is probably given by an equation like uh, life expectancy equals to something like 75 minus um, so this is number of cigarettes per day, minus three times number of cigarettes. Uh, so this is, this is our regression. And can you interpret this number three? This is a regression coefficient. So initially we have uh, initially we have model like this one, and uh, uh, in this model is uh, obtained uh, after fitting of this model to this data. So uh, can you interpret this number negative three? Okay, this is plus beta one. So beta one equals to negative three, estimate from data. Uh, 
what does it mean that beta one equals to minus three? How can you interpret it in non-mathematical terms? So if, if we have this law, uh, how can you interpret this number minus three? How it is related to this straight line and how you can explain what, what this number minus three means uh, from, uh, from the perspective of just which social implications you can conclude from this from this number this number shows that the line will go down mm -hmm. uh, and it will mean that uh, the more cigarettes per day one smokes mm -hmm. the less uh, his or her life expectancy is Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and uh, this is uh, this is what we see from the sign of this number, and uh, ex and if we are interested in the value, this, that this is minus three, not two. What does it mean? How how can you if you if you have to explain uh, if you have to explain this model for for politician who don't know mathematics at all, who don't know any formulas, what would you say about this coefficient? Coefficient shows how fast life expectancy uh, is dropping. Mm -hmm. uh, and how fast? The... Quite fast, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just say that uh, each additional cigarette uh, per day decreases your life expectancy by three. Yeah. So this is uh, this is what uh, this formula shows us, and. Geometrically, it means that uh, if we shift uh, one position to the right, uh, we also have to shift three position to uh, to the bottom. Okay. And uh, now uh, we use this data, and we say, okay, look, we we collected data, we did some statistics. We uh, uh, fit our model, and we get this result. Um, let us assume that you are a smoker who wants to uh, to uh, argue that these results are not convincing. Assume that you are in parliament, and some regulation is discussed to forbid any smoking and uh, you want to you want this legislation to be rejected uh, what what would you say to uh, to argue that this is not the proof that smoking kills How can you argue that this picture is not a proof? Well, based on some common sense, we can say that we don't know other factors mm -hmm. uh, which can actually also influence life expect expectancy in mm -hmm. our sample. We don't know uh, other information or our uh, participants of our experiment. Uh, yes. Uh, so basically, uh, what we want to conclude is uh, some causal, some causal uh, fact that smoking is the reason uh, why uh, people live less. Smoking is a reason uh, for the decrease of the life expectancy for those people who smokes. 
And uh, as we discussed previously, uh, um, in the data, we see only, only some correlation. This correlation can be expressed in terms of correlation coefficient. This correlation can be expressed in terms of this slope, uh, slope coefficient in the regression analysis. But anyway, uh, this, is, this is just a correlation. This is just uh, um, a statement that uh, those people who smoke more, they uh, live less. But uh, as we saw here in this example, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that we have uh, a causal relationship between these two variables. Uh, so if we want to argue with uh, the positive answer for this question, we can say, okay, no, uh, this, does not, this does not prove it because there is some alternative explanation. Uh, for example, here we had an alternative explanation uh, and this explanation is very reasonable. Uh, we said that age uh, affects weight and age at the same time affects number of words. And uh, we know how, uh, how uh, kids, uh, how children teach uh, their language and how they grow. And we understand that this uh, diagram is much more pl plausible that uh, the diagram uh, that says that weight is uh, the cause of uh, increase of number of words. Uh, so uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to convince me that this data doesn't prove that smoking decrease the life expectancy, uh, please give me some alternative explanation probably involving some other variables, but uh, just, it is not, uh, it is usually not enough just to say, probably we didn't take into account something uh, because you can say it in any case. And if these kind of arguments uh, would be allowed, uh, no, no scientific claim can, can be done because, uh, we can also ask, okay, probably we, we didn't uh, take into account anything. But and now I want to, uh, I want some alternative explanation. Why it is possible that we have this negative correlation, but, uh, but we also don't have positive answer for this question. Any ideas how to explain? this decrease of life expectancy for those who smoke. Again, we can just use our common sense. There is not a mathematical question, just a common sense question. Especially you can imagine this discussion that was uh, 100 years ago. Any ideas? I don't know, maybe stressed and depressed people smoke more and they tend to die faster. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it is possible that there are other reasons like stress. Uh, probably, uh, probably, we have, uh, pro probably we have a diagram like, like this. We have stress, and uh, this stress uh, affects smoking, and also this stress uh, affects life expectancy. Yep. Um, but uh, it is not very clear how to measure stress and it is not very clear how to, okay, um, probably, this, uh, probably this arrow needs more explanation. Uh, probably you can, uh, you can um, argue about some other reasons uh, why life expectancy can decrease. 
especially for stressed people, for, for people who, for example, live in bad conditions, uh, um, why their life expectancy can decrease. They're stressed, uh, they smoke a lot, uh, they probably don't have some more, um, more healthy ways to relax. So probably they do something else uh, that is related to the decrease of their life expectancy. Any ideas? They are also drug addicts or something. Yeah, yeah, probably. Uh, probably we have something like this. Okay, well, let us not go uh, as far as to drugs. Probably uh, if people are in stress, they also like to drink alcohol. And probably alcohol is uh, what decreases life expectancy. Uh, so basically now we have two we have two possible diagrams. Uh, probably we have this situation and probably we have this situation. And uh, in, in fact, it is possible that uh, we have some combination of these two diagrams. So it is theoretically possible that life expectancy is affected both by alcohol and smoking. But now let us look at these two extremes. So uh, in this case, we believe that it is alcohol that kills people. Uh, and smoking is merely correlated with this alcohol because they are both uh, of um, the, because of this causal relationship with stress. And uh, in this case, we believe that alcohol is fine, but uh, smoking is what kills people. And both of these picture are in agreement with our data. Uh, it is not possible to use this data to decide which picture, uh, which picture is correct. Right. And now uh, let me ask you, uh, how do you think, uh, how can you probably by doing additional experiments, probably by collect collection additional data, how can you, uh, how can you choose between these two pictures? How can you answer which, is, which picture is correct? Also count data on how um, how much alcohol drinks person per mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now we have three variables. We have life expectancy. Uh, we have a uh, number of bottles per day. And we have number of cigarettes per day. And we have some data in this table. Okay, and uh, how would you use this data? So, uh, in fact, uh, what should we compare uh, to, uh, to decide between these two pictures? What kind of properties of people uh, should we compare? And how, how would we select these people? Um, I don't know, but probably... Uh 
How does it English? Независимая переменная. Independent variables. Yeah, yes, thank you. So life expectancy will be independent variable, mm -hmm. and number of bottles and number of cigarettes will be dependent variables. Mm -hmm. And we should compare them with mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, uh, yes, uh, Dash is correct. Uh, we can consider a new regression uh, where we have life expectancy as a function now uh, of two other factors. Uh, so number of bottles. Okay, uh, beta one previously was number of cigarettes. So let us keep it in this way, number of cigarettes uh, plus uh, beta two times number of bottles. Uh, so you see that this is a new model, uh, and in fact, uh, your values of this coefficient, when you feed this model to the data, uh, the values of this coefficient can, of, of, the, of this coefficient of beta one can change. Uh, probably uh, even, even if the data that you collected is in agreement with this picture, uh, when you add this uh, additional variable, it is possible that uh, the value of this, uh, of this coefficient will change in your estimate. Uh, basically, uh, the, the way how we estimate uh, these betas is uh, exactly the same uh, as it was done in, in case of uh, bivariate regression. Uh, did, you, uh, did you discuss uh, uh, OLS, ordinal least squares, yeah. on the previous lecture. Yes, I guess. Uh -huh. So uh, the same the same OLS uh, is applied, but now uh, you're trying to find not value of two variables of two coefficients, beta naught and beta one, but three coefficients. So you have again you have some optimization problem. You have to find such uh, beta naught, beta one, and beta two, uh, such that uh, the difference between uh, life expectancy that you see on the data and uh, this value that is predicted by your model, uh, that these differences, uh, when they are squared and you find a sum of them, uh, this, this, uh, this sum of squares should be as small as possible. And those values of betas that uh, gives you uh, this smallest value is the estimates that uh, you use. So basically, this is just just like uh, on the previous lesson. But now let us uh, let us look at uh, this. Let us look at this model. Let us assume that we have something like uh, assume we obtained. Uh, the following estimates uh, something like this uh, beta naught 75, uh, beta 1 like minus 2, and beta 2 like minus 1. Something like that. Uh, so how would you interpret this value minus two now for this new model? Uh, note that these two variables uh, are, uh, it is possible that these two variables are correlated with each other. So it is possible that if you see a person who smokes a lot, uh, this person also, uh, also drink a lot of uh, bottles uh, of alcohol. Uh, but uh, 
this is a not uh, this is not an absolute uh, dependence. It is possible to find uh, a person. It is possible to find two persons uh, who, for example, um, have different smoking uh, behavior, but who drink uh, the same amount of alcohol. So uh, it is possible that uh, the diagram for these two variables, number of cigarettes and number of bottles, uh, also demonstrates uh, some kind of correlation, but not, not, absolute cor not absolute correlation. I mean that it's possible that we see something like this. We have number of cigarettes and number of bottles. And we have some values. Uh, so if we compare um, average person who drinks uh, a lot of cigarettes with average person who drinks a small amount of or who, or who smokes a lot of cigarettes with average uh, person who smokes uh, a small amount of cigarettes, uh, then uh, we can expect that the number of bottles uh, is also different uh, for them. But what we are interested in is the question, uh, if we are interested in the question of uh, effect of cigarettes, then uh, we are interested to compare, we want to compare what kind of people we, we, with what kind of people. So which two points on this picture we want to compare. Life expectancy of which two people that are denoted. People who do not drink. Uh, who do not drink? Uh, yes, probably, but uh, it is possibly that we don't have that people. Uh, uh, actually, we are not interested. We are not necessarily interested in people who do not drink absolutely. But if we are interested in the effect of number of cigarettes. It is enough for us to compare people who drink the same amount of alcohol. So basically, we want to compare like somebody here with somebody here. Okay. And if we see that these people who who live who who are here, who yeah, are presented here on this diagram uh, lives less than people uh, who are presented here. It means that this difference cannot be explained by this correlation between uh, cigarettes and bottles. Like right? yes, because we, we fixed number of bottles. Okay. In fact, it is not. Uh, uh, in fact, we can expect um, if we believe in this linear model. In fact, uh, it is. It does not. Um, it is not important where to draw this line. It is important that we select two person who have the same alcohol habits, but different uh, smoking habits, and we compare them. And uh, now if we look at this formula, we see that this is uh, exactly what is given by uh, this variable beta one. Uh, because uh, we can interpret this bit one in the following in the following way. Um, uh, let us select two uh, persons uh, who drink the same amount of, al of alcohol. Uh, but uh, smoke different number of cigarettes.
uh, specifically, uh, let us make it in the following way. Uh, the second person, smoke one cigarette more. Then the first person. Uh, I want to say that uh, the difference uh, between their life expectancy uh, cannot be attributed to alcohol. Uh, just because uh, we, just because they are identical with respect to amount of alcohol. Uh, so if we see that there is such difference, uh, then uh, we have to conclude that uh, that this picture is impossible. And if we uh, choose between these two pictures, if we reject this picture, then we have to say that then probably this picture it takes place and it means that it is smoking that uh, kills people. And uh, if we return to this regression equation, uh, let us see that this coefficient beta one is exactly the answer uh, for this question. Uh, because we have We have life expectancy uh, of uh, the second person. It is equal to beta naught plus beta one number of cigarettes of first person plus one uh, plus beta two times number of bottles. And life expectancy of the first person is beta naught plus beta one times number of cigarettes one plus beta two number of bottles. If I subtract life expectancy of the second person from life expectancy of the first person, you see that this beta naught is cancelled, uh, this uh, bit two times bottles are cancelled because they are the same. And uh, the only thing uh, we have is it is beta one times number of cigarettes first plus one minus beta one times number of cigarettes first. And we can expand this beta one times number of cigarettes plus beta one minus beta one times number of cigarettes. And again, this thing is canceled. And we have this beta one. So uh, we can say that this beta one is uh, effect of smoking, effect of increase of number of cigarettes by one, uh, provided that the other variable, in this case, uh, this is number of bottles, is fixed. So we disentangle two effects, an effect of cigarettes and effect of alcohol, and we can uh, study them separately just because we have this just because we have this model and now if we see that uh, there still exists negative effect uh, of number of cigarettes that cannot be explained by alcohol now then uh, then we must we must reject this picture 
excuse me. Yes. I think I didn't understand it right, but we can do vice versa. We can compare to people who smoke mm -hmm. the same, but drink different amount of alcohol. Yes, we can. And effect of alcohol can be bigger than effect of cigarettes. It is not. Uh, it is not clear how to compare uh, effect of uh, cigarettes and effect of bottles because they are measured in different units of measure. So uh, beta one is measured in like years of life expectancy divided by number of cigarettes per day. And beta two is measured in uh, years of life expectancy divided by number of bottles. So uh, they, these values are not directly comparable, but it is true that, that you can do it vice versa. And you can ask uh, about the effect of alcohol on life expectancy uh, for fixed number of cigarettes, yes. And this effect is given by this uh, variable beta two. Mm -hmm. It is not easy to say that this effect is larger than this effect because it is not very easy to compare them because of different units of measure. But uh, anyway, you can estimate effect of this thing and effect of this thing, right? So we just say that there is a fact and yes, that's yes, all. Yes, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can estimate, uh, for example, we can, okay, we can give, um, uh, basically, uh, if, if uh, we believe in this picture, uh, then uh, we, we are not expecting to see any effect here at all. If we, we believe that the only reason of uh, decrease of life, life expectancy is alcohol, when we fix alcohol and compare only people with the same amount of alcohol consumption, we are not expected to see any difference in life expectancy among them if we believe in this, in this picture. So uh, vice versa, if we see that uh, we have effect here, we have to uh, we have to reject this uh, this picture. This is this is my point. Sorry, I think I still don't understand. So we, uh, I know. So it means that we already have our assumption that alcohol, sorry, that smoking kills, and we do. Uh, Okay. In this picture, in this in this picture, smoking doesn't kill. Yes. In this picture, it is alcohol what kills, and we we want to test: is it true or not? And uh, if uh, if we have uh, if we have this effect, negative effect of cigarettes uh, that uh, still exists even when we controlled for this alcohol consumption. Uh, then we just uh, it, it 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 is not in agreement with uh, with this with this model. Yeah, thank you. Now I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so let us assume that we did this research and indeed we found uh, we found that we have this negative negative effect of uh, cigarettes even uh, when controlled for for alcohol. Uh, what can you do more to argue that uh, we still can't conclude that smoking kills? What other reasoning can you provide here? We can add one more variable and say that it yeah, we can we can draw a picture. Result. Okay, okay. We, yeah, that, uh, that's right. We we rejected this alcohol effect probably. Well, we see that if we take into account this alcohol effect, we still have uh, negative effects for smoking. So this is not the case. But we can draw more complex uh, pictures. Like we can take into account like if people if people smoke a lot, then probably they don't do sport. And probably this lack of motion, lack of sport uh, activity is what kills. And again, you can measure it and you can include it into your account and you can 
and you can uh, consider a more complex model. And again, you can test, is it true that you still have effect of smoking or not? And basically this is what happens uh, sometimes or not, not sometimes, but often on the conferences. Uh, I, uh, I was once on economical conference and after the talk, it was the discussion like, okay, did you, uh, we see your regression. Yes, we see the effect uh, that uh, you, you show, but did you try to take into account this um, factor that didn't, um, that wasn't discussed on the talk? And uh, the author of the talk said, yes, we tried to include this into our model and it doesn't change anything and so on. So basically, uh, on one hand, uh, this uh, thing with uh, multiple regression uh, can uh, be used to, uh, to extract some causal information. But again, to do so, we have to be sure that there are no any other, uh, other, other variable that we didn't take into account, but that is probably, uh, that is probably have to change our conclusions. So again, we have to use some kind of domain knowledge and some understanding of how world, uh, world works and which factors can uh, affect which um, to select between this, uh, to, to at least, to at least uh, enumerate all the variables that can be, uh, that, that have to be tested. And in, in fact, it is not very simple science. Uh, so basically, uh, we discuss now only the beginnings uh, of this uh, of this thing. It is it is. We don't have time to discuss it in details. People who do econometrics uh, uh, can do it better. But anyway, I think that uh, this is very important idea that uh, we have uh, we have some correlations in the data but uh, if we have uh, if we have enough variables and we have uh, some ideas on how these variables can be uh, can um, work together which effects can exist and which cannot we can uh, try to find some causal relationships from the data uh, sometimes we don't need it sometimes we want just a descriptive something descriptive, uh, some description of some correlations between something and something, that's fine. I do not say that we always need these causal relationships, but, but sometimes we need them. Uh, so, are there any questions so far? Can I ask one more question? Yes, sure. Uh, yes, we discussed now this example with smoke and, and alcohol, and as, um, in our model, uh, are alcohol and smoke and independent from each other? No, no. Uh, in fact, if they were independent, uh, then we uh, shouldn't expect, if, if, if they were independent, we shouldn't expect that uh, this picture is explained by alcohol because uh, we say why uh, why we say that this picture can be explained by this by this adding of new of new variable uh, that that is by taking into account uh, alcohol consumption we say that uh, people who smoke a lot they drink a lot of alcohol and possibly this is this is this is uh, this is what we have to assume if we want to to make this uh, to make this argument. We say, okay, uh, we know that people who uh, smoke a lot they drink a lot of alcohol, probably again on average, just because they 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 are under stress. So they um, okay stress, and uh, we assume in this picture that alcohol decreases life expectancy. So uh, this picture is in agreement with, uh, this, uh, with this picture, 
only if we assume that smoking and alcohol are correlated. Because otherwise we just, well, otherwise this, this explanation just doesn't work. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And yes, and in conclusion to this question, um, if for example, we do drug testing, mm -hmm. for example, our drugs help to heal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, one drug doesn't work without it different so they work only in together mm -hmm. um, we also can get like something like this picture mm. uh, uh, that's uh that's that's an interesting question i think we return to to this question uh, of two drugs that only work together probably uh, just Okay, maybe maybe at the end of uh, of today's lecture. Okay. Uh, some other questions about this part? Yes, I, I guess I missed mm -hmm. the last uh, formula with uh, beta one, beta zero, mm -hmm. beta two. This yeah. One? Uh, yes. Oh, why we have this plus one? Uh, because uh, because I, I asked for two person uh, who have the same uh, the same alcohol consumption uh, but uh, have different smoking consumption and the second person smoke one cigarette more than the first person so I want to estimate the effect of one cigarette and this is effect of one cigarette is exactly the difference between uh, life expectancy of these two persons who are different, who have the same alcohol consumption and are differ uh, and differs only in their cigarette consumption. And so I say that we have number of cigarettes uh, that first person uh, smokes and number of cigarettes that second person of sm smokes is just uh, this number plus one. I see, thank you. Mm -hmm. So more questions? Okay, we can probably continue. And uh, the next story is that uh, everything works good uh, with regressions until you work with numeric variables. Uh, but uh, sometimes you have to include uh, some non-numeric, some categorical variables in your model. Uh, for example, we are studying uh, life, life expectancy again. Uh, and uh, we are studying number of cigarettes. And uh, we have also city. And let us assume that uh, we have data. Um, we have two cities, Moscow and St. Petersburg. Something like this. And uh, I expect that city also can uh, affect this life expectancy. Uh, for example, I can uh, I can assume that people in Saint Petersburg live more because of better ecology there than in Moscow, or vice versa. Probably, probably it's an opposite effect. Probably people in Moscow live more because of better healthcare, something like this. And I want to take into account uh, this uh, effect of city into my regression model. Uh, but I cannot just put this city into, into my model because uh, I, I, have to, I have to do some arithmetic with uh, these values. And how do you think, uh, how can I take into account this, this city variable?
how to put to take into account possible difference in life expectancy between cities. Any ideas? We can turn them to the original numbers, like Moscow zero mm -hmm. is B1. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In fact, uh, we just convert uh, this column uh, to column, uh, let us call it city equals to St. Petersburg. Uh, and uh, in this column, we just put uh, zeros and ones. And now we can consider a model like life expectancy uh, B to naught plus B to one times number of cigarettes. Sorry, not a linguistic examples today, but I think uh, it is easier to think to think about something very, very real world, something very natural. And B to two times this variable city equals. Since Peterborough. Uh, so uh, I put uh, uh, I put uh, this condition into square bracket, and uh, this notation means that if this condition is satisfied, then uh, the value of this thing uh, is one, and if this condition is not satisfied, then it is zero. Uh, so this new variable is usually called done variable. So this is done variable. And uh, let us uh, discuss uh, the meaning of this coefficient uh, that stands near this dummy variable. Let us assume, for example, that uh, after fitting to the data, we have something like uh, we have something like uh, b to naught equals to seventy two, uh, b to one equals to negative two, and b to two equals to four. Uh, how would you interpret? this value of beta 2. If the city is St. Petersburg, mm -hmm. uh, then it has positive fact count on four. So four years more. Mm -hmm. On four yeah. years yeah. more people in St. Petersburg live than in Moscow. Yes, exactly. Uh, if we compare two persons, uh, with the same number of uh, cigarettes per day, uh, this this should be fixed because it is possible, for example, that people in Moscow smoke more than people in Saint Petersburg or something like that. So every time when we when we interpret this regression coefficient, uh, we have to say that uh, we see the effect of this variable, provided that all other variables are fixed. Uh, the same. And uh, so the interpretation here indeed is that uh, people in St. Petersburg uh, live uh, four years more uh, compared with uh, people in Moscow. Uh, with the same uh, with the same number of cigarettes. Yeah. Because if we just if we consider two two persons uh, with the same number of cigarettes, that 
and we, we assume that the only difference between these people is uh, their city, then uh, for a person who lives in Moscow, we do not have this term at all because uh, this variable would be zero. And for uh, those person who lives in St. Petersburg, this thing uh, is one. And it means that uh, we have just to add uh, the value of this coefficient, in this case, four, uh, to this thing. So indeed, it means that if we switch from, from Moscow to St. Petersburg, but keeping number of cigarettes the same, then uh, we increase uh, life expectancy by four years. Okay, so this is uh, the interpretation of the coefficient for dummy variable. Are there any questions so far? And if there are more than two cities? Yeah, that's a, that's 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 exactly the question that uh, that uh, I planned to ask you. What to do if we have more than two cities? Let us assume that we have Moscow, Saint Petersburg, uh, and Yekaterinburg. Uh, what can we do now? Any ideas? We can count three times and make down a variable uh, three different cities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we can add even more than variables. So basically what we can't do we can't encode Yekaterinburg by two. This is uh, a bad idea because in this case, uh, in this case, it is not clear how to interpret uh, the corresponding coefficient. If we have only a zero and one, uh, it is clear that this interpretation is uh, that we switch from zero to one. But if we have, uh, if we put uh, for Yekaterinburg, we put here number two, uh, what does it mean? It means that the difference between St. Petersburg and Yekaterinburg should be the same as the difference between Moscow and St. Petersburg. But why? Why uh, we can expect this to be true? It is not, it is not, uh, not clear. Probably we have to put here not two, but three, or probably we have to put two here and one here. Uh, so we have a lot of ways how to do it, uh, and it is not clear which one is correct. So instead of this encoding, uh, we will use different encoding, uh, and we will add yet another column. Okay. Whenever you write, you don't have enough space and it, it, it does not depend on the medium. I don't have enough space on the blackboard and I don't have enough space in virtual blackboard on my uh, uh, but I can uh, I can fix it. Yeah. Uh, so we can add here new variable like city equals to Yekaterinburg. And uh, this variable would be 0, 0, 0, 1. And in fact, if you have variable, categorical variable with um, k different values, uh, then you can add k minus one dummy variable to encode this categorical variable. Uh, you see this minus one because, for example, in this case, if you have three cities, uh, you have two dummy variables. You don't need the third one because if we see two zeros, then it means that it, it, this is Moscow. And now we can, we can consider even more complicated model like life expectancy 
equals to B to two C two since Peterborg. Can I ask now? Yes, sure. So we can have only two dummy variables, but we can also make three. But there is no need in it, right? Uh basically you you can't uh because if you add uh if you add the third column, for example, if you have three cities. And you have in you if you add three dummy variables, then these columns uh, would be dependent between each other. So you know that if you have two zeros here, you're absolutely sure that you have uh, one in the third column that you would add. Uh, and this makes our model uh, um, you can't. Uh, then you can't fit uh, your model because due to this dependence between variables, uh, it is not possible to estimate the coefficient. It, different, different coefficients, uh, different sets of coefficients, different values of coefficient uh, would give you the same results. Uh, so uh, in linear regressions, uh, in linear regressions, you do, you do this dummy encoding with number of dummy variables. Um, one less than number of category uh, number of category values. Uh, it is possible to use some machine learning algorithms that are not uh, that are not suffer from this dependence between variables. Uh, like if you use uh, if you use regression with regularization, or if you use um, uh i don't know decision trees or something like this uh, then probably it is not problem to add uh, more columns but for just vanilla linear regression it will not work uh, i hope for, uh, uh, frankly we we don't need to add uh, any dummy variables by ourselves because r will do it automatically for us so what we have to do is just to understand uh, what uh, what they are uh, because in the output of r you will get this this variable like this one and you have to understand what does it mean um by the way what is beta 3 how would you interpret beta 3 in this case So assume that you know that beta three equals to like one. What does it mean? Mm, that people in Ekaterinburg live more than people in Moscow. Yes, exactly. Uh, live one year or more. Uh, compared with uh, people in Moscow. Uh, of the same, uh, with, uh, again, with the same number of cigarettes. Uh, again, uh, we see that if uh, if city is equal to Moscow, then both of these variables will be zero, right? And uh, then our prediction is given by this part of equation. And if city is Yekaterinburg, then you add to this thing to add, you add this beta three. So beta three is exactly the difference between Yekaterinburg and Moscow. So basically, the level, uh, the category, the, the category value that corresponds to uh, zeros uh, is the so-called base level, 
and the interpretation of this coefficient of these coefficients is that you compare a particular level, for example, since Peterbrook, with the base level. Here you compare Ekaterinburg with Moscow and St. Petersburg with Moscow. Does it mean that we cannot compare Ekaterinburg and St. Petersburg? Well, you can just subtract uh, one uh, variable from another variable and get some value, but it can be uh, uh, it can be difficult to probably to estimate uh, things like uh, like significance, but uh, in, in any case, you can uh, you can ask R to use different base level. So if you if you want to compare since Petersburg with Ekaterinburg, then you can uh, you can ask R to use different base level. Uh, but also you have to be careful here because again, if you have several groups and you compare them pair wisely, then uh, we again. Uh, met with the same problem like multiple comparison problem that uh, led us to use uh, ANOVA test uh, previously uh, when we discussed that you can just can't do t-tests with several uh, with several groups but uh, there are tools that allow you to compare to compare three 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 effects uh, in, in this way also but I just don't remember their names but I can probably find them uh, so this is how this thing uh, work. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, um, answering uh, Dasha's question about two drugs uh, that work only simultaneously, uh, you can probably consider the following model, uh, like uh, disease duration. Okay, I forgot how to write disease. Uh, like disease duration as a function of, uh, for example, For example, you have two variables in drug first. And in drug second. So uh, in this model, you have effect of uh, one drug and effect of another drug. But if you expect that uh, these two drugs only work simultaneously when given simultaneously and you want to catch this effect uh, then uh, you can probably add a third dummy variable uh, that asks is it true that uh, sorry mm -hmm. uh, not very good just a second. We have to use different variables here because uh, it is possible to to give two drugs simultaneously. And Uh, one second, I lost connection. So uh, drug first uh, administered 
and there is another variable drug second administered and uh, we have third variable that works like this drug one administered and drug two administered uh, this uh, this variable is called interacting term. This is called interaction. And uh, it means that this is an effect that both drugs are administered uh, that does not um, that does not include it in the in the particular effects of uh, these drugs if they are considered alone. So we see that if we, uh, if we give both drugs, then uh, we add this beta one, beta two, and also beta three. All these uh, three, uh, three coefficients are turned on. So this beta three measures additional effect of their interaction, of interaction between these two drugs. So this is, possibly an answer to your question. At least how to model, how to model this kind of effects. Uh, probably we will discuss it in more details uh, later at the next lesson. Um, but now I think we can, uh, we can make a break and then continue with uh, practice. Uh, are there any question? Any questions more about uh, about this part? Yes, I think mm -hmm. I have one more question about mm -hmm. uh, comparison of Saint Petersburg and Yekaterinburg. Mm -hmm. uh, you told that we can just make. Uh, beta can, two minus beta three. Yeah, something like this. Yes. And we so it it will be three, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Four minus one is three, and yes. mm -hmm. it means that where people live more in Saint Petersburg or in Yekaterinburg. In Saint Petersburg, because uh, since, uh, because Saint Petersburg oh, yeah. is four years better than Moscow, and Yekaterinburg is only for one year better than Moscow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. More questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, then let us make a 10 minutes break and then continue.
Um, guys, let's wait for two minutes. Just I need to prepare everything. Bum, bum, bum. So I've sent you a data set where you can find uh, where you can find the data that you will work today on. Так. Так. Mm. Okay, so today the topic of the today's seminar is uh, multiple regression. Uh, and when we talk about multiple linear regression, uh, we have new problems compared to uh, sim uh, simple linear regression with one predictor. Uh, what are those problems? So um, let's think about one uh, important question. So uh, what do you think? Uh, if you have more predictors in the model, is it better than having fewer predictors or not? What do you think in general? Probably yes. Mm -hmm. So it means what is better? Yeah. Uh, exactly. So can you could you expand your your idea? It's excellent idea. Let's just expand it. I think as far as I understand, uh, when we have more predictors, we can. Uh, simultaneously look at them mm -hmm. and compare at the same time uh, all so different predictors mm -hmm. but i think our model can be uh, can be worse mm -hmm. or not yeah well, and to me, in which case uh, our model can be actually worse with more predictors one predictors are dependent on each other. Mm -hmm. So I mean different predictors. So we have a lot of predictors and some of them, some of them depend on each other. Mm -hmm. And in this case, our model cannot, can work not good. Mm -hmm. But why, I mean, it sounds like at first glance, uh, it sounds logical that the more predictors better. And if you just uh, throw in uh, all possible predictors, uh, you can't fail, right? What can go wrong there? C do you have any idea what is a potential problem that we can face? 
it can be formulated in many ways actually. So there is no like uh, one correct answer because uh, there are many views on this problem uh, from machine learning view or statistical view, it doesn't matter. But uh, maybe you have an idea why actually having more predictors can be worse than having less predictors. Not just like equal, equally good models, like with you have like uh, in which uh, like you have a uh, model where uh, where um, you have more predictors, and this is this model is not only uh, like equal model to the more simple model, but it it is actually worse model than just. If there is not so much data, there will be problems with me. What, what is the problem? C can you like formulate what is the problem here? Why it is a problem? Any any ideas? Okay, so uh, uh -huh. will not get significant result. No, um, don't think about significance. Significance is uh, like uh, significance is a tool that we use, like uh, significance testing, null hypothesis significance testing. Is uh, it as a tool? So like um, saying that the tool will not like uh, give us what we want. Uh, it's not, uh, not the core of the problem. So actually uh, in both cases, uh, model will be significant. So, so that, that, that is not the right way to explain. So, uh, Okay, uh, let's answer the more like uh, grounded question. So look at this, uh, look at these dots. So you have a predictor, uh, so you have a X uh, column of data and you want to predict Y as, a, as an outcome. So what do you think will be uh, the best uh, model for this data? Linear regression. Right. Yeah, yeah, well, maybe I will try to do it better. No, I'm bad in drawing straight lines, but I will be better later, I think. Yeah, something like that. But what if you uh, actually do some more complicated line and it will be like, let's say, uh, let's choose color. Eh, sorry. This, yeah, this one. So imagine you have you draw something like that. It will be not linear regression, but you definitely can do this line if you add in your model. Actually, you can do it with a, a multiple linear regression. You just need to add coefficients like, uh, and let's be like here it will go, I think. Uh, you can add some um, uh, like squares, third degree, fourth degree uh, coefficients in your model. And in this case, you will get, uh, uh, get the model that like uh, actually will fit data even better than the straight line. Do you see my point? So in this case, with this uh, model, it is a perfect fit for our uh, data. So if you compare, uh, for example, ordinarily list squares, in this case, it will be just zero, right? 
And of course, it will be less than, uh, than for example, if we uh, compare to our simple linear model. Right, because in simple linear model, you have some noise here. And you, in, in uh, so in this, uh, but yeah, you understand the, the point. Uh, in this uh, curve model, the red one, uh, you have, uh, uh, you have just zero or very small, uh, residuals. So least square uh, sum of least square sum, let's help. Sum of squares, residual sum of squares. So error says, sorry. So uh, sum of squares of uh, residuals, so unexplained variance will be uh, higher for this more simple model. But what do you think uh, is, uh, is the best model here uh, between these two? And why? Just try to think about it. So do you understand the point? So it sounds like uh, this uh, model, this curvy red uh, model explains the data better than our straight line model. But it sounds like a nonsense, right? Because, well, uh, because, well, um, because why actually? What's wrong with uh, this uh, uh, complicated curly model? What, what's wrong with it? Probably this curvy model will be very bad with some new data exactly that's uh, that's a real point uh super thank you very much uh if you add some new data to this uh to this uh, uh to this models uh our green model actually will uh get better results than our red model so if we add some, of course, I mean, if there is uh, that, of course, in the case, uh, if uh, we have really something like a linear regression with some noise, and it seems like uh, it is, it'll, it's actually more uh, likely situation than uh, that we have something like that. Of course, maybe, this model is actually correct, but here it's like um, something like um, using uh, Akama's razor principle. Uh, well, it is most likely that the most simple model that explains your data is the best one because uh, it will uh, it will be very uh, likely that if you fit. If you uh, feed this model to new data, it will be like more or less the same pattern. So the new point, uh, sorry. Uh, bum, 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 bum. This color, it will be like that and that and that and that and that and that. So in these cases, uh, if you uh, uh, calculate uh, residual sum of squares, uh, 
interesting thing can happen. So uh, if you calculate these differences for new data set, for red model, it can be much higher than for the green one. For green one, it will be more likely close to residual sum of squares that we had for uh, for the first data set. But for, uh, uh, for this curvy model, uh, it can happen like uh, we had zero and now we have really huge uh, residuals, uh, very huge variability that we didn't explain uh, with our model. So this problem, maybe some of you know, uh, in machine learning, this problem is called overfitting. It's very, very basic and important term that like uh, without knowing that just don't even try to, uh, to apply for, uh, for every like job for in industry, I think. <laughs> uh, so that's the problem when um, we try to explain too much, we try to explain something that we actually can't explain. Uh, because of course, we, when we uh, record our data, well, when we measure some, uh, uh, some parameters, uh, we'll not, we won't be able to record everything that is significant to the process. Uh, for example, if you think about, um, if you think about, um, let's say, uh, uh, real estate prices, uh, we can like uh, add uh, size of the size of the flat, uh, size of the house, uh, even somehow. Um, uh, we can count like prestige of position and uh, and some more complicated uh, features, but there are, uh, there will always be some features that we can't just put in the model. Maybe they are very small. Uh, maybe they are really important. For example, uh, you cannot uh, easily extract uh, fanciness of the furniture. Yeah, you can uh, uh, calculate somehow uh, price of your furniture, uh, but um, uh, for example, you can see example uh, of a, a very expensive flat by Louisa, I don't know how, Krivanogova, or maybe, I, I, I don't remember the name, uh, for uh, that try to uh, rent it, uh, for 700,000 rubles, but, uh, and uh, furniture was very expensive, but it, it was very bad taste for the furniture. So actually uh, it will not attract many people. And these features are very hard to measure. So uh, you always fail to measure some uh, things in your data, uh, things in your process that you try to explain, and you need to just to like uh, get used to that. So just just be with it, just uh, cope with it. Uh, so there always be some uh, unexplainable variants, and uh, the worst thing you can do with this uh, uh, unexplainable var variants is to try to explain this unexplainable variables. So if something is not expla uh, ex explainable by your predictors, just, yeah, it's just a limitation of your model. Uh, don't uh, try to catch some noise if you know that it's just a noise. So uh, to deal with this problem of overfitting, uh, of course, in like in uh, machine learning, you have like this uh, uh, things uh, about uh, cross validation and uh, division by uh, test and train uh, uh, samples and so on. Uh, but uh, today we will focus on another thing, 
uh, is to uh, on on uh, why we use uh, adjusted R square uh, when we um, assess uh, the model quality instead of just simple R square. So if you if you have a look on uh, Uh, if you if you have a look, if you have a look on um, uh, adjusted R squared formula, I don't remember it by by, by heart, but it's very very simple, like uh, Wikipedia. Just uh, where is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, adjusted to R squared. R squared. This is a, uh, I think this is a formula. Yeah, this is a formula. Uh, it's actually just R squared adjusted for the number of uh, parameters, mainly for number of parameters. Of course, of, uh, by the number of uh, observations too, but the main idea uh, for uh, adjusted R squared uh, compared to the simple R squared is that we uh, punish our model for having too many predictors. Uh, and that's why uh, using uh, adjusted R squared is more preferable when you uh, use many predictors uh, because uh, this punishment for many predictors is what, uh, is what we want actually uh, when we uh, add uh, many predictors, because we want to explain uh, as much as possible, but uh, we want, uh, 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 if we use just simple R squared, if uh, we uh, increase number of predictors, we'll always get more and more uh, R squared, even though uh, these predictors uh, have nothing common with uh, uh, with, uh, with the outcome. So if you add some, if you try to explain, um, uh, uh, you can try to add some uh, predictors to explain your uh, real estate uh, price. Like you can add uh, predictors like weather on Mars, uh, I don't know, number of, um, <laughs> Number of uh, let's think about meaningless predictors that you can measure. Actually, some of them will not be so meaningless, but you can I don't know you can add like um, uh, number of uh, number of uh, like uh, uh, of. Um, amount of money that a person who uh, visited this uh, uh, house for assessment had with him when he visited this house. I don't know, oh, weather months on Mars in this day, or uh, 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 number of uh, uh, likes for Kim Kardashian when this house was uh, was added to the website for selling houses or whatever. You can add many, many predictors and uh, even though they have no connection with your outcome, every predictor will uh, mathematically just explain a bit better your uh, model. And, but even, even though it's actually uh, has no relationship to your outcome, uh, just pure noise. So uh, even though uh, your R squared will increase with every new uh, uh, predictor. So to compare models with a uh, different number of predictors to punish for having meaningless predictors, uh, it is better to use when you uh, uh, when you do multiple linear regression, not just simple R squared, but this adjusted R squared. So okay, let's return to our to R. So there is a data set, and let's have a look what we have in this data set. So. 
So uh, it's a psycholinguistic experiment dedicated to uh, lexical decision and uh, uh, word naming. And uh, in this experiments, uh, subjects are asked to decide whether the word uh, shown on the screen is a real word or not. Like do I, okay, just, you know, like the word you can, that you see here. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, you can see that even non-existent words, they uh, look like real words. So, uh, uh, so you need to think about whether it is like, real word that you remember somehow or just artificially created, uh, but grammatically correct, but, but uh, just a uh, pseudo word. Uh, and uh, for word naming, uh, uh, you, you need to just pronounce the word. So let's see. Uh, the columns. So for oh, okay. What's it? Thirty uh, x. So yeah. So for each subject, you have a group like uh, it's either young or old. So just two groups. Uh, somehow artificially divided, maybe by median uh, age. Uh, a category of the word is a, a noun for N for noun, and uh, V stands for verbs. Uh, RT Lex DT, uh, Lex uh, Dex, the first column is a, a reaction time in uh, visual lexical decision. Uh, I think it is logarithmized uh, reaction time because uh, usually reaction time has a uh, distribution very close to log normal distribution. So if you logarithmize this data, if you logarithmize uh, reaction times, you will get something like a symmetrical distribution. Um, it's a complicated question. Should you do that or not? But we have what we have here. Uh, we have what we have here. Uh, reaction, time, uh, uh, reaction time for word naming. Uh, again, I think it's logarithmized. Uh, length of words in letters. Where is it? Yeah. I actually, you can do that uh, if you if you want to do that for for uh, for word. You remember you have a, a simple function and char that will calculate number of letters of the word, right? Okay, so uh, let's choose only uh, young people and uh, only nouns. And also, on, uh, uh, let's focus on just a few, uh, just a few columns because because we have too too many of them. So, let's use tidyverse. So, let's select only young. Uh, filter. Filter. Uh, H subject. Yeah. Right, and next is uh, word category. Word category equal to n. Okay, now we have only nouns and only young uh, subjects. Uh, and next, let's do. Mm, let's uh, select only a few columns of interest. Uh, 
with a select function. Uh, let's do reaction time for lexical decision uh, as a main uh, outcome variable. And let's also uh, extract some uh, some uh, variables uh, as, a, as predictors. For example, written frequency. Written frequency here uh, is uh, like how frequent uh, is the word. So you can see the word R is very frequent. Uh, the work as words uh, volume or jet is not so frequent. Uh, frequent. Uh, okay, written written frequency. Uh, next, we'll use uh, Lincoln letters because, of course. Um, the longer your word, the longer you need to, the more time you need to read this word. This uh, connection is very straightforward and like, it's very obvious connection. Um, uh, let's also take um, morphological uh, family size. Family size and What's next? Uh, mm -hmm. Number uh, simplex synsex uh, synsex. Uh, uh, it's a looks and transforms uh, count of cinema sets uh, for for the word. So um, let's see. This column, you can see. Number. Yeah, numbers and things. So let's see some. This one. Block. Yeah, you have many synonyms to block. All for stress. And not so many synonyms for. Uh, okay, I've lost this column. Yeah. For what is this? Moves. Yeah. You don't have many synonyms for moves because it's moves, you know. Okay, let's extract it and let's call it a uh, small. So let's explore uh, this uh, small data set. So if you remember, you have a uh, function scheme and uh, schemer package. To explore it, you can see that, yeah, you have no uh, missing values. That's good. Uh, uh, we can also, can plot this uh, uh, with a simple plot function. It will just uh, create uh, uh, pairs of scatter plots for every uh, column to every other column. So like how uh, reaction time like this deck uh, associated with uh, written frequency, length in letters, family size, and number of simple synthesis. Uh, uh, you, you can find that length in and letters and everything is, that is connected to, to, to it is has some something like lines of dots because, of course, you have either one, two, three, four, or five letters, ah, two, three, four, five, six, or seven letters in the word. You cannot have 5.5 .5 or something like that. So it's a discrete variable. That's why you have these lines here. Um, 
Okay. And now let's do uh, linear regression uh, with all these predictors. Uh, with outcome uh, RT, uh, RT uh, like that. So again, as we used uh, during the previous seminar, we'll use this function uh, LM. Uh, and uh, the first parameter for this uh, function is formula. Do you, remember, uh, do you remember how to write a formula in R for linear regression? What is first, what is next? First is dependent variable. Next exactly. Tilde. Dependent. Independent. Uh, and, yeah. and what are, uh, what do we have after the dependent variable? Tilde. What is the symbol? Tilde. Yes, yes, Tilde. the tilde symbol. Uh, it actually means uh, equal sign uh, if you write it uh, in the symbolic form uh, somewhere, for example, in, in a scientific article. So, and then you, you have uh, predictors. So, uh, if you have different predictors, uh, uh, you just List them all connected by plus sign. So uh, when we had just simple linear regression, it was like that. Uh, we uh, we uh, set up a formula. Uh, we also need to uh, set uh, the data that we use. Data equal to small, the second parameter, and we get something. Now with a multiple linear regression, it's not that's complicated. You just need to uh, um, uh, put all your predictors that you want put, to put in your model uh, divided by this plus sign. Link uh, in letters. Uh, yeah, for the first uh, thing we can uh, Right with uh, two predictors. Uh, okay, when we had um, when we had uh, uh, one predictor for linear regression, uh, it was uh, just a straight line, right? Uh, but when do uh, when we have two predictors uh, in linear regression, how could you uh, How can you uh, draw it geometrically? What it will be in geometry form? Try to imagine. So you have two predictors and one outcome. So you have a, a, you have three dimensions. So you have three D space. So what your uh, linear model will look like uh, in this three dimensional space. Just try to, to, to imagine what it would look like. Like some blanket, I don't know. Blanket? What do you mean by blanket? How, how is it? Like sheet of paper or like flag, which is like have some wind in it. I, I, I don't know. It, it, it will be not the, the line, but the... Yeah, but uh, by blanket or flag, it sounds like not something not linear, something with waves or something. You mean something like that, or you mean something otherwise? So something, uh, uh, something different. I don't know something with curves in in in, in some places. Uh, well, actually, it is still linear, so it still has no uh, for for multiple regression like that. We have uh, we still have only straight lines, but because it has 
uh, two predictors, not one. It's not uh, just a straight line, but it is a plane. So I will show you just, uh, let's just like Google it. Predictors, two predictors, uh, linear regression, because it's uh, important to uh, understand uh, how it will look like for, yeah, it will be like, just let's find some good, yeah, something like that. But this uh, figure is a good one. So in this case, you have a plane as your model, not a straight line, but a plane. So uh, here, y axis income, or in our case, it will be reaction time, or for uh, real estate prices, it will be real estate price. And you have some uh, predictors. And now you have uh, two parameters, uh, and they can vary on this, uh, they move on this plane. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and uh, residuals are uh, the differences between these dots uh, to the plane. So, and of course, uh, square differences, not just uh, difference with plus and minus, square difference to this plane. Uh, and if you talk about more predictors than two predictors, it will be hyperplane. And of course, when we talk about uh, four dimensions, we can somehow imagine four dimensions, right? But if we talk about like uh, 10 dimensions, of course, it's impossible to imagine some such thing. So it is a hyperplane, but the idea is that it will be something like a linear uh, plane, but in many, many dimensions. So, okay, let's add uh, other, our other uh, predictors too. Uh, what's next here is uh, family size, family size. Family size, possibly. Family size, right. Uh, and this number, Simplex uh, right. So now we have a uh, uh, we have uh, five coefficients. So uh, now it's like um, uh, the formula is something like. Um, like RT is equal to uh, intercept this uh, intercept plus uh, mm, this uh, my minus. Zero, zero dot three multiplied by written frequency plus uh, zero, 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 five uh, multiplied by length and letters and so on and so on. So, yeah. So we have a more complicated formula, but it's still linear. So, and uh, again, if we, uh, if you want to see not just this coefficient, but we want to check whether they're significant and other things that we, uh, uh, that we can, uh, that we saw uh, when we do uh, model, RT, let's say that yeah, model RT. We need to use a summary function on the model uh, RT object. So remember that when you run this function LM, uh, 
uh, you create uh, uh, an object that actually, an R object that actually contains both the fitted model and the data. Uh, so uh, if you just print it as a result, it just give you this coefficients. And that's not that you are interested in you actually just coefficients. You are interested in R squared for uh, significance for uh, uh, each specific uh, coefficient and so on. Uh, and to get this more um, advanced information, uh, to get this more advanced uh, information, you need to uh, use function summary on this uh, object that you create. So it's better to uh, save this uh, result of the LM function to some uh, variable, for example, model RT. It's actually a good idea is to add as a suffix to the um, name of the model, like uh, name of the function that you use for a model. So if it is a linear model, you just add LM. Model RT LM. And get summary. And now you have all this extra information that uh, we had previously. Uh, do you remember uh, why uh, for z we don't have uh, mean here, only median? Because it will be zero. Even. Exactly. Uh, mean for Z-dolls, uh, for uh, just ordinarily least square regression, is always zero, just by definition of how, how, how it's calculated. Uh, mm, but what we can say about, uh, by, by, this me, uh, by this medium? What do you think this median can say uh, to us? <coughs> is it a small or high? What's, what is important about this median? It seems to be very close to zero. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, in which cases? Median and mean are very close to zero. Just imagine distribution of data. Uh, let's, for example, uh, take some some of these uh, predictors uh, or even outcome, and let's uh, draw a histogram. Hist of ink. Um, let's see. You get here. Uh, do you think? Uh, do you think uh, uh, mean and median here will be close to each other? And what will be higher, mean or median? Just from the histogram. So you can see that it, it, is, it has some asymmetry. It's not very high asymmetry, but at least you can see some asymmetry here. And you have some tails on the right side. So there are a few, but relatively large values compared to this side where you don't have such values. In this case, I expect that it's a uh, uh, situation somewhat similar when we, uh, to the situation when you compare uh, salaries. Uh, there are some, uh, there are a few uh, people that uh, actually this situation it's more like uh, uh, salaries in Scandinavia maybe, where you have some people who get uh, salary much higher than everyone, but it's not just ten times higher, and there are not so many people like that. Uh, so uh, mean in this case uh, will be somewhat higher than median, and median will be uh, what is the uh, uh, size of salary or what is the logarithmized uh, reaction time uh, for the uh, like middle man for the main in the uh, in the middle who is not the best one or the worst one. 
And median will be, in this case, it will be slightly lower. At least I expect that by the form of distribution. Yeah, you can see, uh, no, it, it is actually, uh, like the deck. Oh, it's actually even a bit higher. Interesting, interesting. Uh, I didn't expect that. So it's very, it's quite symmetrical actually. Uh, so the difference uh, is very small, you can see. Uh, so uh, there is some difference, but it's not even in the uh, way I supposed uh, it will be. Uh, so for more, um, skewed uh, for more skewed uh, distributions you will get higher differences between uh, mean and median uh, and uh, it can actually say uh, like it's uh, not the primary source but secondary source of, uh, of information about uh, quality of your model when uh, median is close to zero for Zedals, it means that uh, it is a like median and mean are close here because mean is zero, right? Uh, and it means that uh, distribution of residuals is somewhat symmetrical. So maybe it's not perfectly symmetrical, but somewhat symmetrical and it's okay uh, in terms of this uh, assumption for the model. Uh, okay. Uh, we'll, we, we'll have a look at this uh, more precisely uh, a bit later. Uh, next, we have uh, 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 information about coefficients. Uh, and remember, the first coefficient is, is intercept. It's not that we are usually interested in because it's usually uh, significant. But no hypothesis for uh, for that will be uh, that uh, um, uh, intercept real intercept uh, in real relationship uh, is zero. But well, it is uh, clearly not our case uh, because uh, first of all, even uh, if it's uh, logarithmized. Uh, values uh, of reaction time, like mean reaction time cannot be zero, right? So logarithmized uh, reaction time cannot be zero too. It uh, can, uh, reaction time cannot be negative. So actually uh, significance for the intercept doesn't say anything uh, in this case, because we already know that, yeah, it is, it is not zero, right? It's, uh, it's how the world uh, should, work actually. Uh, so we are more interested in other coefficients in the model than the uh, intercept. Uh, so uh, let's have a look and uh, you can see uh, the estimate. Estimate means the value for coefficient, at least how we estimated it uh, from our data. So that's why it's estimate because we don't know real coefficients, we just try to estimate them. Uh, and of course, for uh, every estimation you have, uh, you can calculate some standard error. Uh, uh, so like potential uh, error of measurement for uh, estimate. And based on estimate and standard error, you can calculate uh, T value just uh, actually uh, estimate divided by standard error as usual. Uh, and uh, then based on T distribution, you uh, can get a P value uh, that, do you remember the definition of P value? I will ask you this uh, every seminar, I think, because you know, it's important. I told you, so could someone repeat it, please? I can try. Yeah, yeah. It's possibility to observe current data or more extreme values. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and next, in, in which 
like model of the world because under new hypothesis yeah under new hypothesis assumption so we think that our new hypothesis is uh correct uh and we uh, get some statistic like key statistic based on our estimate and steroid error and uh, calculate uh, what is the probability of getting uh, this uh, statistic or it means actually this estimate or even more radical, even more extreme if our null hypothesis is true. Uh, what you can say uh, here for written frequency, the value and how can you interpret it? Don't be shy. It's okay to, to have mistakes. Uh, just to assure you, uh, so many uh, smart professors do mistakes uh, in the interpretation of p value. So it's not problem for you to, to, to have mistakes, but uh, uh, try to be, try to learn to be better than these professors. So just Can you actually yeah. remind uh, the null hypothesis here, please. Yeah, uh, null hypothesis for all these uh, coefficients is zero. Uh, what does it mean that uh, uh, null hypothesis is zero for all uh, these coefficients for every uh, coefficient? Like in terms of uh, relationships, in terms of uh, like uh, connections between uh, predictors and outcome. What does it mean if our estimate, uh, our uh, real um, coefficient for linear model is zero? What does it mean for some predictor? Not in statistical sense, but in more broad theoretical sense. If, uh, for example, I know written frequency uh real uh coefficient is zero what does it mean it doesn't influence our model our yes data. it doesn't influence outcome so that's simple so we want to disprove that we want to say it's like uh, the logic of uh um thing from contradiction right in geometry so we start with the idea that uh, uh, there is no connection between predictor and outcome we want to, and we want to disprove it uh, we get these values and we say that well if there is no connection to get uh, the probability of get this high test statistic uh, test statistic, and even higher or lower the statistic is so small that we can uh, we can uh, throw out our null hypothesis that the predictor does not influence our outcome. So we can accept our alternative hypothesis that written frequency somehow influence uh, outcome in linear way. And is it positive influence or negative influence in this case? And can we say, uh, so we, uh, based on this p value, is it small or high? Can you say, based on our p value, on this p value, what can we say? That there is negative influence. Yeah, so p value is very, very small. Uh, yes. So this three asterisks uh, means that it's lower than 0, 0, 0, 0,001, less than 1 divided by 1,000. Actually, even much less. It's very, very, very small. In 1 to like 2 multiplied by 10 uh, with uh, uh, 16 zeros. Uh, cases, so uh, it will be even lower uh, than this value or higher than uh, 
uh, absolute uh, value of this value. So because it's two-sided, uh, so in this case we can disprove our uh, we can uh, throw out our null hypothesis uh, and accept alternative hypothesis that there is some connection. And because uh, this number is negative, we can say that it's uh, uh, not like the, the higher written frequency, the lower uh, the lower reaction time for for decision. So it's it actually makes sense. So uh, the more uh, popular award, the more common award, uh, the uh, the easier we understand that it is a real world uh, word, right? Sounds logical for me. Um, okay, and what about the next predictor? Maybe, uh, thanks a lot, but maybe someone else want to uh, participate too uh, and, and interpret another uh, predictor the same way? I want your, your activity because uh, that's very important thing because to uh, it's very easy to Google how to do linear regression. It's just one line of code, right? Okay, two lines of code. And some reports think, yes, it's a complicated thing. You need to learn it, uh, you need to master the skill, but just conducting uh, linear regression is just uh, one or two lines of code. Uh, but what is more complicated, more difficult is to interpret the results that you have. So you have this asterisk, uh, what can you say by this asterisk? That's something that you will do in your research. So try to do it now in a safe space that we have here. I hope that you perceive it as a safe space. So don't oh. worry, yep. But I, I, as far as I understood it before, three asterisks means that this variable is uh, important and it shows a fact. Mm -hmm. And if there is no where no asterisks, then there is not important at all. So the mm -hmm. more asterisks, the more um, the better is a fact. Well. Um... It's very common way of thinking, but you are somewhat wrong. Because actually a uh, number of asterisks or actually size of p-value that doesn't say about the size of effect. Yeah, it says uh, about effect size when uh, we have uh, the same uh, sample size. But uh, for example, if you have real huge data set, if you collect, I know, one million observation, uh, observations, uh, even very, 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 very small effect will be very significant. So you have uh, for, uh, you will have three asterisks even for very small effect. But if you have, I know, where only 30 observations, uh, you will get for uh, quite huge effect maybe just like one asterisk. So don't like, mm, uh, p-value doesn't say about effect size uh, directly, right? It's, it's, it's important thing to understand. Um, so uh, the easiest formula for that is like, uh, uh, it depends both on effect size uh, and uh, sample size. So if you have the same sample size, you can compare uh, models by p-value somewhat, it will be not very good idea, but still somewhat you, you, can, you can say that. But um, in general, as a general rule, um, it will be considered to be somewhat mistake because, uh, yeah, as I said before, uh, uh, for very small effect, uh, but with very large sample size, 
you will get very significant results. But for a uh, very small sample size, uh, you will get uh, not uh, uh, so low uh, p-value, even though your real effect is huge. So you need to think about that too. So, okay, let's return to Lankin letters. How can you interpret? Excuse me, can yep. I ask? So, of course. Mm, well, I think I told, so I thought the same. So our asterisk shows the p-value, right? Yes, yes. And, uh, okay, so yeah. that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just p-value is not equal to effect size. That's important thing that I wanted to to to, to say. Um, so. But when I when we say effect, we also mean effect size and sample size. Uh, sorry. Uh, but I thought um, when we say effect, we also consider sample size in the definition of effect. Oh, uh, well, uh, effect, no. Actually, when we talk about effect size, uh, it's a specific uh, statistical term that actually uh, used for uh, um, thinking about effect size uh, that is not related to uh, sample size. So, um, for example, you can say like uh, difference in intelligence in IQ between two groups. It is a, like, uh, for example, um, uh, effect size will be the difference like of uh, five points, right? For example, between two groups. For one group you have 100 uh, IQ score, for another one you have 105, right? Uh, the effect size will be five points. Uh, and even if you have uh, 30, uh, 30 um, uh, subjects for each group, or you have 1 million subjects for each group, uh, effect size will be five IQ points. But for uh, small, uh, sample size for if you have 30, uh, 30 uh, subjects in each group, uh, this difference uh, can be not significant. It, it will be uh, very more likely to be not significant than uh, in the case you have one million uh, sample for uh, sample size for each group. It's actually uh, the topic of uh, statistical power calculation. It's a very important point. Uh, it's a very important point. Uh, so uh, that you need to consider when you uh, conduct your research, uh, you need to think about how many subjects, how many data you need to collect. And uh, that's uh, like, um, there, is, uh, there are some bad practices and good practices, but it's not the uh, point for today because we are actually even now out of time. Uh, but can you just uh, like uh, explain this line, like what you can say about length and letters uh, as a predictor for uh, reaction time here? It is a bad predictor. Mm, why do you think? Because there is only one star. Yeah, but actually, well, what does it mean that uh, you have one star? Uh, that, uh, well, in only 2% of cases, uh, if null hypothesis uh, is, uh, if null hypothesis is true, in only 2% of cases, uh, you will get even higher, uh, e even more extreme results. So again, well, um, we have quite large sample size here. So indirectly, we can say that, uh, yeah, it is a, um, as a predictor, it is not, uh, there is no uh, huge uh, influence because our sample size is quite big. 
uh, and the p value is not that small, but actually to be 100% correct, you cannot say that uh, uh, this is a bad predictor just because you have uh, one asterisk. Uh, asterisk. Uh, no. You can say that it's significant or on the border of significance, but it means that, well, it's, it's exactly what it says, that uh, probability of getting this or even more external results uh, under assumption of null hypothesis uh, is 2%. And is it good or bad? Well, it's up to you, but the tradition is that if it's uh, less than 5%, it is, uh, it is good enough. So actually, yeah, there is some connection, maybe small connection, but positive connection that uh, for uh, uh, more length letters, you recognize uh, for more long words, you recognize them faster. It seems maybe there is no just simple linear uh, connection because maybe there is some more complicated uh, assertion, structure assertion behind this just linear connection. But but it seems that as it's very small, but uh, maybe small, but uh, some connection at least. So, okay, and you can also discuss it with uh, 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 this way uh, on other predictors too. Uh, let's go to our R squared. Do you remember what is R squared means? What the minimal uh, uh, R squared possible? What is the maximum R squared possible? Is one and zero? No. Yeah. What does it mean when you have uh, zero multiple R squared? Uh, when RSS divided by TSS. Mm -hmm. And it means. No, it's not RSS by TSS, it's one minus RSS divided yeah, by yeah. TSS, yeah. So yeah. residual sum of squares is errors, right? That mm -hmm. you didn't explain. Total sum of squares is what you wanted to explain, right? So uh, when multiple R squared is zero, uh, it means that uh, residual uh, residuals so unexplained difference is the same as a total difference that we wanted to explain. So what we wanted to explain and what we failed to explain is the same. So what does it mean? So it's like this. Our model says, is good. No, it's 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 vice versa. It's when we uh, yes, yeah. it's bad. Yeah. So when when multiple R squares is zero, it's a uh, Let's draw it one more time. Uh, R squared is one minus RSS divided by total sum of squares. Uh, residual sum of squares, it, it's something that we failed to explain by our model. So it's a uh, size of our failure. Uh, total sum of squares is uh, like uh, our total goal that we wanted to explain. So we have some variability. We want to explain this variability. So our good model uh, should say why something is low and something is high. So we have some variability in our world and our model try to explain, to give theory, why this is small and why this is uh, big. Uh, so if uh, R squared R squared uh, is zero, uh, it means that this one is one. So our uh, our unexplained variability is the same that we wanted to explain. So we failed to explain uh, everything. So our model is perfectly bad, not in terms of uh, how we uh, conducted this model. So maybe we have good model in terms of uh, how we 
um, good with our assumptions, but our model just not effective totally. And what, what does it mean if we have R squared that is equal to one? That RSS was zero? Yes. So, so our model perfectly fits. Data. Yeah, yeah, it's it sounds like you, you, you feel how it sounds like model perfectly explains our data. It, it is never, it is never true. Uh, R squared in real life will be never one, uh, uh, and it will be never actually zero because even uh, uh, some just there are some even spurious correlation. You can just, by predictors, you can explain some noise, just even though there is totally no connection between them, just your model fitted uh, to this noise somehow. And actually, even if you add more predictors, you will explain more and more noise, if, even though you are, your predictors uh, have no connection to your outcome. Uh, so if we, uh, for example, add some additional uh, uh, parameters to this model, even just random numbers, R square will be uh, higher and higher and higher and higher each time. And after some dozens of uh, uh, predictors, it will go uh, to, uh, the, it will be very close to one, but you know, we don't want to explain noise by non-meaningful predictors. That's why we look not for multiple R squared for in case we have uh, more than one predictor, but for adjusted R squared. Because in this adjusted R squared, we have punishment for having too many uh, predictors. For example, let's uh, create another model and let's, uh, we had this somewhat bad blank in letters um predictor let's delete it um simpler more simple mm, more simple let's call it and we delete here this predictor and let's get a summary for more simple model and you can see interesting thing Let's, let me show you that. So uh, comparing, uh, yeah, now you can see both values. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean this multiple R squared, it's uh, this uh, multiple R squared for more complicated model and this one for more simple model. You can see that for a more complicated model, it's a bit better, right? But uh, what is interesting that uh, adjusted R squared for more complicated model is actually less you can see here, right? Adjusted R squared. For more complicated model, adjusted R squared is even less than for more simple model. So you can see that this punish punishment in action. So uh, it seems that, well, uh, adding this, uh, uh, what it was that, length in letters, uh, parameter can be not really, even though it's significant, uh, but it can be not so profitable for model if you want, for example, to predict with this model. Yeah, so I think that's all. We are actually out of time today a bit. Uh, if you have any, any questions, you are free to, to ask them. Yeah, excuse me, yeah, yeah. but you told right now just that in more complicated model, uh, R square is less, but I think it's more. It's for, for 
zero point four 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 two. Uh, this one. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I move. Uh, yeah. Uh, this one is more simple model. Yes. Simple. And R square here is less. Ah, uh, R squared. Ah, yeah, just that R squared is uh, still less. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, that's my mistake. But yeah, 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 that's my mistake. But. And it is expected, yeah. right? Because how to say it in English? Dolly Abyssinian and Dispiracy is a proportion of our um, disper variance mm -hmm. is easier. So we, so it's easier with less uh, variables mm -hmm. to divide our data in on like on groups. Divide. It, sorry for me. It's very hard to say it in English. I don't know. Uh, so I mean, we, when we have uh, less dependent variables, mm -hmm. our R squared will always, well, not always, but it will be less than with more variables dependent. No, it variables. will be always less actually. So yes, adding obviously. new uh, new predictors will always increase your multiple mm -hmm. R squared, but not always adjusted R squared will be higher. In this case, yeah, yeah, I was wrong. It, it is still higher, but you can see that uh, difference between them uh, is 15 and here is, so you, you can see the difference between multiple R squared and adjusted R squared uh, here is more then here. So maybe if we add some additional parameter, I know which one to add here. Uh, sorry. Oh, I forgot to use light. Um, let's add some, some, I don't know, something. Some. Okay, I see. I just don't understand what is adjusted R squared. Adjusted R squared is a uh, uh, same as R squared, but uh, but it's punished for having too many uh, predictors. But we can just put after this krivai linea. I don't know how to say the sign is called dot and to uh, to use all the predictors. Yeah. And what then? What will we with adjusted R squared? Uh, for example, we can add, um, yeah, let's try to add some more, uh, let's not, not uh, let's uh, delete this part. And add uh, even more predictors. Uh, more complex. And here, let's add some other predictors too. Um, I know family size. I know we have family size. Um, familiarity. Familiarity. Plus, what do we have else? Written spoken frequency ratio. Written spoken frequency ratio. Uh, it's a derivational entropy. It's derivational entropy. Let's try now. Derivation. I don't know, entropy, and now let's try more complex. You see, now there are some 
uh, uh, some other predictors. Some of them actually became uh, not significant. What's interesting, uh, it's actually uh, the problem of multicollinearity. When you have, uh, when you have um, uh, predictors that are related to one to each other, adding one more uh, predictor uh, that is correlated. Uh, to, to, to others or like slightly changing your data can actually influences, uh, influence a lot your asterisks for uh, specific predictors. That's complicated topic, but uh, uh, it will not affect uh, overall R squared. So if you have like uh, predictors that are very similar to each other, uh, it is very um, uh, assessment of uh, their influence of each uh, uh, of each predictor will uh, very unstable because uh, it will be hard to divide where is the influence of one predictor or another predictor if uh, they are very similar similar to each other. So if they're very correlated, correlated to each other. Um, mm, yeah, but still we have some adjusted R. I think we have uh, still high adjusted R square because uh, we have a very high sample size. If we had uh, less dots because we have really high uh, sample size, if we have uh, uh, less sample size, adding new parameters will influence uh, much more on adjusted R squared and it will be Low, much lower if we add some spurious uh, predictors that are not significant. So if we actually delete something uh, like durational entropy, maybe, just maybe, I'm not sure, but it can be that, yeah, adjusted R squared without this additional, uh, the last one uh, uh, predictor, is actually even more. However, uh, however uh, multiple R squared is the same, but actually here it will be slightly higher, slightly higher. But it's clear that this predictor has no or almost no influence on the outcome. So adding it uh, to, to the model will uh, increase a multiple R squared just a bit, maybe just because of some random noise explained, right? Uh, but adjusted R squared, you can see here, uh, without this predictor, is actually a bit higher without this predictor than for a uh, more complicated model. You can see, right? Uh, compared uh, here. Uh, um, yeah, here you have uh, zero dot uh, four nine eight four for more complicated model, and here you have adjusted R squared zero dot nine four eight seven for less complicated model because it's adjusted R squared and it punish uh, punishes you for having uh, more uh, predictors. And in case when uh, new predictors doesn't explain anything, you can have lower adjusted R squared. So- mm, Yeah, no, I see, thank you. Okay, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's over. Uh, see you next time. I hope you enjoyed uh, playing with uh, linear regressions with many predictors. It opens you to you uh, the new more uh, the new world of uh, 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 high dimensionality. Uh, so see you next time. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.